name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us now acknowledge our sins and be sorry for them. Lord Jesus, you became man that we may all become children of God. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you suffered and died on the cross that we may be rid of sin and iniquity. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you sit at the Father's right hand continually pleading for us sinners. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. May he forgive us our sins and bring us to life everlasting. who founded all the commands of your sacred law upon love of you and of our neighbor, grant that by keeping your precepts, we may merit to attain eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Reading from the Book of Wisdom Ungodly men said, Let us lie in wait for the righteous man, because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. Let us see if his words are true, and let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him, and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. 
Let us test him with insults and torture, that we may find out how gentle he is, and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to what he says, he will be protected. The word of the Lord. The psalm. Behold, the Lord is the upholder of my life. Behold, the Lord is the upholder of my life. Behold, the Lord is the upholder of my life. God, save me by your name. By your power, defend my cause. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. have risen against me, and the ruthless seek my life. They have no regard for God. God for my help. The Lord sustains my soul. I will sacrifice to you with willing hearts and praise your name for it is good. From the letter of Saint James. Beloved, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits without uncertainty or insincerity. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes wars and what causes fightings among you? Is it not your passions that are at war in your members? You desire and do not have, so you kill and you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, 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 I will sing unto the Lord, Alleluia, 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 I will sing unto the Lord. Oh, no. Hallelujah. Through 
the gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Chapter 9 verses 30 to 37. At that time, Jesus and his disciples went on from the mountain and passed through Galilee. And he will not have anyone know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying. And they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had discussed with one another, who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arm, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Lead questions for today. Question number one, how according to our second reading, James chapter 3 verse 16 to chapter 4 verse 3, how according to our second reading does inordinate ambition cause hatred and division and violence and war? And how does this apply to our Nigerian situation, our circumstance in Nigeria? How, according to St. James, does inordinate ambition cause hatred and division and violence and war? And are we able to apply that to our contemporary circumstances in Nigeria today? How? Question two. Identify the elements of true greatness as taught and demonstrated by Jesus Christ in today's gospel. To teach that lesson, Jesus actually acted a drama. Did a movie skit. Question three. What are you doing and what more do you intend to do in order to put Jesus' teaching on selfless service and sacrificial love into practice? What are you doing right now and what more do you intend to do because you must be struggling to grow more than you were yesterday? in order to put Jesus' teaching on selfless service and sacrificial love into practice. And question four. Today's readings present for all Nigerians a powerful lesson on good 
godly leadership. Discuss briefly. Today's readings present for all Nigerians. Those who are aspiring to lead, those who are already leading, those who appoint leaders, those who elect leaders, those who help to rig people into leadership positions. All of us. Solomon, you're laughing. Those who help to rig people into positions of authority. Eh, all of us. Those who are victims of rigged elections. All of us. Today's readings present for all of us a powerful lesson on good, godly leadership. You know, I used to feel insulted when, really insulted when they say hey, people deserve the kind of leadership they get. When they say hey, people get, deserve the kind of leadership they get, I say, how can, you, how can you say so? But maybe, maybe when you have a pack of idiots, they deserve to have a crown idiot as their leader. That doesn't mean that 100%. It means there may be 10, 15, 20% of people who are not idiots there. But because they have not worked hard to educate the other people around them, if the idiots are the majority, who do you expect to be their leader? That's it. So unfortunately, a people deserve the kind of leadership they get. That's my own discussion. I want your own discussion. Yes, maybe. I want to attempt question number two. The elements of true greatness as taught by Jesus Christ in today's gospel are service and childlike humility. Service and childlike simplicity, right? Is the child humble or the child is just being himself? <laughs> childlike openness. Simplicity. Childlike, um, a childlike disposition where the child has no guile. The child cannot plan schemes. Right? The child cannot do deals. What you see outside is what is inside in a child, right? Openness, simplicity, innocence. Thank you. So, so are you saying that to, to, for, to be great, people should be innocent, like child? Yes, Father. Ah. That one will be hard in this place. Oh. That is for true greatness. Okay, true greatness, not yes, any Father. kind of greatness. Yes, Father. Ah, okay. So name it again, one. Service. Service. Can we all say that together? Meaning, service. is it just service, stomach infrastructure for my stomach? Service of? Of others. Service of others. Two. Humility. Simplicity. Childlike simplicity. Childlike simplicity and innocence. Service. Give her a round of applause. Those are, those are values and virtues that are scarce in our environment, isn't it? Because even small children are no longer so simple now. You know, one of the, one of the characteristics of a child is lack of self-consciousness. The child is not self-conscious. But the way we are beginning to do with our children, even at age six, seven, eight, children are becoming self-conscious. We are removing childhood from children. Do you understand? One of the features of a child is that it's not self-conscious. It's not self-conscious. It can begin to play with a toy and be there forever. It's not, conscious. It's not self-conscious. But when you start raising children, and from very early age, the child is self-conscious. Particularly self-conscious about his or her looks. You know, I keep complaining about this. About his or her looks. Too early in life, you have, you have removed innocence from that child. You have removed innocence. And that's what we're doing in our generation. So, one of the features of childlikeness that Jesus talked about is not to be too self-preoccupied. Not to be too preoccupied with ourselves. 
but to look towards others. Yes, uh, Tony. May the name of the Lord be praised both now and forever. Amen. Father, permit me to attempt Mr. One. Okay. Inordinate ambition comes when our passion, according to the second reading of St. James, when our passion is at war with our members. Who are our members? Our ourselves, our inner self. Uh, the, the parts of our, our body. Yeah. I mean, that, I find that, very, that expression very interesting. You see, when pa our passions are at war with our members. Did you take note of that? And I ask myself, who are our members? We are mind, body, soul, and spirit. Those are our members. So our mind has certain values, right? But our body is pursuing certain passions. Is it not at war with our mind? Our spirit has certain values. We are related with God. We have, a, we have a couple of spiritual values. And then when another member of ours is at war with those values, what is happening? St. James puts it very well. Our passions are at war with our members. That is why there is war. That is why there is division. That is why there is hatred. Yes. Yes, and also when we seek for something and we don't get it because it's at war, um, our passions are at war with our members, we tend to fight, hate people, create division, violence, and war to make sure we get that, those passions which are about When we desire something and we don't get it. And human beings are full of desire. We always desire things, right? But you see, a grown-up human being, the human being that has grown, that has matured, a human being that is enlightened, knows that it is not everything I desire that I will get. That I will desire a thousand things, I may get five, ten. But what happens with somebody who has not grown up is that as he desires, he must get it. Right? And if he doesn't get it, it will lead to all these things that St. James lists. Hatred, division, violence. I mean, some of you, we have some of these tyrants, little tyrants in our houses, don't we? Little tyrants. I want my breakfast and I want it now. <laughs> we have these little tyrants. They desire something and if they don't get it, they start breaking things in the house. Am I the only one who knows that there are such children in our environment? We have them. You deny a child. You say, bring that iPad. It's time for you to go and sleep. And the child decides to start breaking your things in the house. Can you already see members at war in this child? Can you already see it? So even in our homes, even with little children, you can already see that. You desire something, you don't get it. Then you begin to break things. And that is why I tell people, train your children that they will not get everything they desire from the earliest age, from age one, two, three. Train them that they will not always get what they desire. Otherwise, what you have at home is a little tyrant. And just last night, we were discussing and we are talking about marriage. Sister was talking about some program they have to help marriages so that too many marriages do not collapse. And I was saying, the real issue is that we have 12, 13 year olds going into marriage, meaning 12, 13 year olds in mind. They are, they are 35, they are 30, but they have not grown beyond 12, 13 year old in their mind. And then we have people who have not developed resilience, meaning their parents have always given them everything they ask for. Now he now asks the wife for something. The wife said no. He's not used to hearing no. He's not used to hearing no. He's a spoiled brat. Spoiled idiot. He's not used to hearing no. It becomes problem. 
The young woman too, who has been pampered and spoiled, is not used to hearing no. And then, of course, during the period of, 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 of courtship, uh, you are the sugar in my tea, you are the whatever, people fool themselves with all that. And then when the real marital life re re resumes, then do this, and then he says no. She is not used to hearing no. This is the problem, that life is not complete. You don't get everything you want. In fact, many don't get most of the things they want. And yet, life remains beautiful. Right? Life remains beautiful in spite of that. Many of the older people who are here, they did not get most of the things they wanted when they were children. Not so. Many of the older people who are here. But it is these older people who are here who decided to spoil their children and say, me, I suffered when I was a child. I will not let my child suffer. I say, your child will be an idiot. This is the problem. So, it is, it is this desire, you desire something, you don't get it, you are ready to heal. So, we need to, we need to begin to look into our desires. The mystics tell us, the mystics of our church tell us that all suffering comes from desire. How did I say it? All suffering comes from desire. You want to reduce your suffering? Reduce your desire. So, you desire something, you don't get it. You, let us learn that most of the things we desire in life, we will not get. Because life is not complete. Life beneath heaven is not complete. We simply make the best of what we have. If, you're not, if you don't get what you like, you begin to like what you get. That's the source of happiness. That's the route to happiness. Give him a round of applause. Questions? Yeah, Azubike. I want to attempt question four. Question four. The readings today challenges us all. Focus on self giving, not self promotion, it is part of the challenges of the Nigerian state, Nigerian people, Nigerian leadership. The readings tell us that uh, true greatness lies with true greatness lies not with what Nigerians practice, Nigerian leaders practice, but from the lessons we are learning from today's uh, the, the the teachings of Jesus, even to his uh, disciples, uh, teaching humility, teaching service, teaching that it is not wealth, it is not power, it is not rank. At least, I mean, is a nation to greatness. It is our sacrifice. Is Actually, our it is the service of leaders and the sacrifice of leaders that That's lead nations towards greatness. greatness. When leaders do not know how to sacrifice, the nations are going down the drain. As our own is going down the drain. When leaders do not know how to sacrifice. Leaders are to point the way of sacrifice and selfless love. Leaders are to show what the common good is and how to live your life in service of the common good. It is leaders that show that. Me, I have a problem when people keep saying, all Nigerians are bad. It is Nigerian followers and leaders. I say, who is meant to show the way? When the Bible says, the book of Proverbs, when it says that the people perish for lack of knowledge, who is to impart the knowledge? It's the leaders. When the Bible says, the book of Proverbs says that, um, uh, the, that where there is no vision, the people do perish. Who, has the vi who is supposed to have the vision? The leaders. What is leadership? Leadership is not about building bridges. Leadership is not about building bridges and railways. Leadership is about setting a vision. It's about having a vision and making people buy into your vision. So where there is no vision, the people do perish. So I'm tired of, of the victims being blamed. Victims of visionless leadership are constantly being blamed for the lack of vision of their leaders. Well, where they have a blame is that they have continued to vote into power 
visionless leaders. Aha. That is where they have a blame. Uh, but part of it is that you know that it pays the oligarchy, it pays the rulers to keep the people ignorant and be knocking their heads together. You na Ibo, you na Shekiri, you na Hausa, you na Yoruba, our great grandfather 200 years ago, two fought, and your grandfather defeated my father. So I am not going to be your friend. How many of you? How many of you? How many of you read the recent uh, post of uh, David Hundein on, on this matter? He says, go ahead. Keep, keep fighting over your tribes. And there are experts in Washington who are discussing the collapse of Nigeria by 2030 and how they will come and harvest your resources after you people have collapsed. Be fighting over... He said, tribe that once you cross this boundary, nobody knows those tribes. All they know is that there is a Nigeria. Now, they, you'll be fighting. Keep, keep fighting over all those things. He says, people are there. People are writing doctoral dissertation projects on how Nigeria is on the way to collapse. And the only way you can avert it is come together and work towards a better country. Not keep knocking your head over, you know, You know, I, I seem to be contradicting myself. But you see, this thing about people get the kind of leaders they deserve. I used to fight for many, many years to say, no, I, me and my people, we don't deserve this. But indeed, if you decide to remain in primitive ethnic bigotry, then you deserve a top bigot as your leader. Yeah. So we need to all begin to educate our people to come off it. Come off this nonsense. Come off this nonsense. Yes, they say Nigeria is a geographical contraption. A geographic where no nation is organic. All the countries you see today, look at all the map. God did not design any map. The people came together and decided that, oh, we have been relating for such a long time. Well, let's be, we could be one now. Oh, it is some conqueror that brought us together. Yes, but we have been relating together. Uh, let's, let's go on. I mean, let's, let's, let's move on. And the average Nigerian has friends across the border, right? Across the country, have friends. But for the benefit of the rulers, for their own self-indulgence, their selfish benefit, it pays them to knock the heads of the people together. It pays them. So the day we will wake up, you know, I keep quoting Anthony de Mello, who says, many people are born in sleep, they go to school in sleep, they marry in sleep, they give birth to children in sleep, and they die in sleep. The day we decide to wake up from our sleep, then we will begin to make progress as a country. May that day come soon. Amen. Finally, Father, it tells us that uh, selfish ambition is the because of uh, disorder and discontent that we have in our nation. Selfish ambition, yes. That, that we have in our nation. And reminds us that the, the noble virtue that Christ himself represents. Service and humility. So rather than selfish ambition, eh? now my turn, now my turn. Aha. Rather than selfish ambition, let us walk towards service and self-sacrifice. Service for the common good. In fact, one, there's something that many Nigerians don't really understand. It is about, it is the imperative of the common good. That you see, when it is good for everybody, it will be good for me. If I keep pursuing my own selfish good, then it cannot be good for everybody. And eventually, it will not be good for me. I mean, when leaders from local government chairman to the president, when leaders need bulletproof vehicles to go to their village. Does that not say something? Azubike, if you need bulletproof vehicle to go and greet your grandmother in the village, what does that say about us? And practically all the top leaders and corporate leaders are with bulletproof vehicles. This is idiotic. If leaders need bulletproof vehicles to go and greet their mother, their grandmother in the village, 
what does that say about the quality of leadership that we have? So clearly there is a problem about our concept, our notion of leadership. When, you, when leaders need people, uh, uh, gun totting uh, kill and go people to chase their own people off the road for them to pass, it means we are sitting leadership on its head. That's not leadership, that's conquest. Can you say that together? That's not leadership, that is conquest. If you need kill and go people to chase people away from the road for you to pass, I say that is not leadership. Something is seriously wrong. True leaders, and we had them in the first uh, uh, republic. They used to go around in open vans, jeeps, and be shaking people and be greeting people and be going into the marketplace and so on. Oh, Lord, bring back those days. Yes. I want to add to question number two. Yes. Um, the phrase of who wants to be first should be last. And I see it as he who wants to be at the top of leadership should be able to serve the least in the society. And when the least in the society cannot access a leader, you have lost touch with the people. When the least in the society have no access to the leader, then you are not a leader. You are a conqueror, period. You are not a leader. If the least in the society cannot access, not long ago in this country, some of you who are young, you would have heard of people like Aminu Kano. No, Aminu Kano fed more than 500 people every day in his house. The least in his, the quarter where he lived in Kano had access to his house to eat. Some of you would have heard of Adedibu in Ibadan, the Amala politician, right? The least in the place where he lived, they had access to his house. Scores of people, I don't know how many hundreds, ate Amala, ate food in his house every day. So the poor had access to the leader. They were true leaders because the poor had access to them. But when the poor have no access to you, you are saying, that's not a true leader. Yes. And the leaders just remain in a bubble, so you can't relate to the challenges um, people are facing. Maybe true news, which the, their advisors cannot tell them the truth. The advisors themselves are a problem. <laughs> the advisors are a problem. But I don't even think it has to be only the advisors. I think the leaders, they know. They know. They are seeing the situation. They hear, they listen to news. May the Lord grant us good leaders. Great. I, there's a question not answered. Question three. Yes, is that question three? Okay. Glory to Jesus. Father, yesterday was Desert Day of Prayer, and the topic we treated was pure and authentic religion in the eyes of God. And it borders on selfless service and sacrificial love. In my own little way, I do my best to reach out to those that are vulnerable around me, like the gate man the people that throw away um, trash, I reach out to them. I do my little best to help them out in any way I can. Collect their trash. I give them food sometimes. I give them food. Oh, okay. The people who collect trash. Yes. Oh, okay. They are among the poorest. Okay. Yes. And then for the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, as much as possible, I make my own little contribution to the work they do for the church. And I go out of my way also to visit the elderly, those that have been struggling, those that are down. These are all the things you have been doing. What about, what more? So, um, I, it's just to no try problem. more, do 
more than I have been doing. To reach more you know, people. To reach more people. To, to be more present to people. To make sure that people around me are, especially in these times, I know things are hard. I would try as much as possible to reach out more, to give more. And challenge time, other people to reach out. My time and resources. You can easily speak to people. So challenge all these people looking at me to do more. Okay. My yeah. brothers and sisters, because everybody knows that times are hard, but all of us have something we can give. Not just financial um, resources, but our time our ta and our talents. Thank give you. a round of applause. Okay, Jesus predicts his passion. This is the second prediction. If you remember last Sunday, Jesus predicted his passion and Peter said, what are you talking about, right? Jesus predicts his passion and death again. Last Sunday, we saw Jesus presenting himself as a suffering servant who will be rejected, humiliated, and killed. Following this prediction of his passion, Jesus asked his followers to take up their own crosses daily if they truly want to follow him. Now, as Jesus travels to Jerusalem to face the impending suffering and death and anxious to make his disciples understand the meaning of what lies ahead, he makes another, we call it the second prediction of his passion. Mark chapter 9 verse 31. He once again contradicted their understanding of his identity and mission. Up to this point, the disciples understood him to be simply a miracle worker and a political messiah. And they saw themselves as the privileged companions who will be chief of staff, who will be ministers, who will be senior special advisors. Now, even after predicting his suffering and death the second time, the apostles still did not understand. You know what? They actually started discussing among themselves what? Who was the greatest? Who was the most important? Who should... I mean, which position is more of a national security advisor or chief of, the chief of staff or this? They were, yes. Now, and when Jesus asked them what arguments they were having along the way, they kept silent in shame. This is because the discourse was driven by selfishness and inordinate ambition. They showed how little they had learned and how poorly they had understood Jesus' mission, unfortunately. Jesus brought a child and set that child before them. He challenged them to welcome the little child in its powerlessness, helplessness, meekness, weakness, vulnerability. We added innocence, right? Children are unpretentious. They can't pretend. That is why when you tell your child to tell the visitor that you are not in, the child will tell the visitor that mommy says I should tell you that she's not in. Where is mommy? She's in the room. But she says I should tell you that she's not in. So children are unpretentious. They are incapable of plotting, of scheming, of conspiring, or conniving to deceive or betray others. Actually, when you start teaching your children like that to tell lies, you are robbing them of childhood. I hope you know that. So there are people with children who are three, four, five, but they have lost their childhood because you have stolen their childhood out of them. Children are open to learning new things. The adult believes that he already knows, but the child usually is full of wonder and ready to learn new things. Jesus likens himself and his kingdom to that little child powerless child who cannot resort to power tactics when threatened or maltreated. A child who cannot defend himself, whose only protection and defense is his father or mother. Jesus' complete trust in his father makes him vulnerable like a child. Unless the disciples embrace that vulnerability, they will never understand the way of Christ. Just think about it. The way of Christ is unique. And many people who say they live the Christian life really don't understand this. So many people still think that Christianity is about power. And I keep saying, I've misunderstood the whole thing. The Old Testament religion may be a religion of power. If you are serving the God of Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and so on, you conquer all your enemies. But I keep saying, Show me in the New Testament 
that equivalent in the New Testament. What Jesus brought to us is, a, is an embarrassingly weak religion. It's a religion of weakness. If there is power that comes from the religion of Christ, it is the power that comes out of weakness. If there is power that comes out of the Christian religion, it is the power that lies beyond Calvary. Not on the way to Calvary. Uh -huh. They are silent because the thing don't shock them. The Christian religion is very clear. If the Son of God will allow himself to be crucified shamefully on the cross, that's not a religion of power. It's a religion of weakness. The first set of disciples of Jesus Christ, many of you know, the first set of disciples of Jesus Christ, 10 out of 11 of them, they were killed mercilessly and they couldn't save themselves and their God didn't come down to save them. So when people keep talking of, talking of Christianity as if it's a religion of power, 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 I just say, you have not read the gospel well. If you have read the gospel well, then you will know that there is a big difference between Judaism and Christianity. Some people can't even see the difference. It's as if it's the same religion. There's a big difference between Judaism and Christianity. And that transition already started from the time of the prophets. You can already see that transition from the time of the prophets. See how the prophets suffered. The prophets of God, the Holy One of God, the Holy Ones of God. And then the holiest of the holy ones of God, Jesus Christ. I mean, see how mercilessly, see how John the Baptist died. And we are not told that John the Baptist bounced back three days after. Right? He died, he was killed, they cut his head. We are not told that the head was later united with the body. This is the reality of the Christian religion. It means that the, the reality of the Christian religion is such that unless you believe in the resurrection, you can't make sense of religion. Unless you believe in life beyond Calvary, you cannot make sense of the Christian religion. And I keep saying to people who are preaching the prosperity gospel that you will make many people run to the psychiatric world. You will send many people to the psychiatric world. Because until you recognize that the joy of Christianity, the peace of Christianity lies beyond the cross, lies beyond Calvary. Until you teach that and your people understand it, you are not yet communicating Christianity. Which is why St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 19, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 19, if our hope in Christ, like the Old, well, like the Old Testament, if our hope in Christ were for this world alone, then of all people were to be most pitied. That's why I'm saying many people will run mad if our hope were in, uh, in Christ were about this world. Unless the disciples embrace that vulnerability, they will never understand the way of Christ. And you know what? We human beings constantly run away from vulnerability. We don't want to be vulnerable. We want to be powerful. It's instinctual. In putting the child before the, his disciples, Jesus challenges us to do what? One, as the way to, of the kingdom. Two, relate with the father with the openness and trust of a little child. Three, take to heart the weakness and neediest members of the community. Now, what that means, what that means is that, as, as uh, Chipweze said, if you are a leader after the mind of Christ, you must take to heart the neediest and the weakest in our midst. Otherwise, you are not. Next, recognize that power, privilege, and prestige are not the model of Christian discipleship, but rather vulnerability, service, and sacrifice. They are neither the model of Christian discipleship nor Christian greatness. It is instead vulnerability, service, and sacrifice. Next, Understand that true greatness consists in being the last and the servant of all. This is 
this is the kind of thing that um, I remember Enyang and uh, Robinson and Co. They went, they went to one school to teach integrity and to teach this thing. And they say, look sterile, says, come. Abi Francis, didn't they say that you people were, look sterile, say, scam? Meaning, how can you tell us to follow this path when all other schools are following a different path? It means they will cheat us now. So they said, look sterile, you say, scam. So this Christian way, from the point of view of, of, of the worldly people, he says, scam. Like the disciples who we too are often plagued by inordinate ambition. The ambition to be honored and celebrated, right? Why do we love celebrities this much? It is because we, we, we salivate when we see that they are popular and we wish we were like that. To be honored and to be celebrated, to be center of attraction, to rule. So if we cannot be center of attraction, at least we put the photo of somebody who is center of attraction by our, uh, as our, what do you call it, screen, screen saver. To rule, to control, to dominate, to lord it over others. We like people who rule, control, dominate. I mean, I remember it was Bishop Kuka who said this, that look, these poor people who come when a big man takes his Lamborghini or Rolls Royce to the village, who come and look at the glass. Uh -huh. He said, eh, at least somebody from our village get this big car. So he's proud that somebody from our village get this car. Do you remember Lagos, that documentary on Ojota that was made, BBC documentary? How many of you remember? A BBC documentary. When the guy says that, eh, we, my... The person get messages from my village. Your village, anybody get messages? <laughs> so, my poor people are actually proud that we have an oppressor in my village that has a messages bench in your own village. Do you have any oppressor that have? <laughs> so, we love to see the people who occupy positions of honor and are celebrated and are center of attraction and rule and control and dominate and lord it over all that. At least he is speaking my language. Bush people. This is why the it is because of this attitude, it is because of this mindset that the prosperity gospel is so attractive to our people. There has to be something in the environment that makes this, this new gospel so attractive. There was already something in our environment. It's a, it's a fertile soil for it. That's why these guys are cashing in and smiling to the bank. It's a fertile soil for it. But I warn them that it won't last for too long. But these inordinate ambitions, according to St. James, spring from the conflicts of selfishness and greed, as well as the blind lust for power in the human heart. They spring from the war among the members in the human heart, person, the members of the person. St. John admonishes believers in 1 John 2, 16 to 17 as follows. Can you read For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride in riches comes not from the Father, but from the evil one. The selfish desire for wealth and power and popularity results often in ruthless and aggressive competition that destroys human relationships. For some reason, in recent times, I have not heard much of court cases over chieftaincy tussles. I think it has reduced. We used, to have, we used to have tons of cases in the courts over that chieftaincy title. It's my, my father's line, and I can't, the, my ancestors will not forgive me if I don't fight for it. Uh, that chieftaincy, it has, uh, Victor, has it not reduced? It has reduced. The desire for these things often blind us or bind us to the world of violence rather than to God, the God of peace. James chapter 4 verse 4. As they bring about division and conflict, oppression and the persecution of the just, violence and death. St. Paul says that the love of money is the root of all evil. You remember this, uh, I do say, a world of ruthless and aggressive competition is a world of violence and death. That's what St. James is talking about. For, can you read? 
What you compete to get, you will compete to keep. For others who will compete to snatch from you what you competed to grab from them. Again, what you compete to get, you will compete to keep. Because others will compete to snatch from you what you competed to grab from them. Yes, a world of ruthless competition is a violent world. It's a violent world. Are you going to watch your neighbor gather, gather everything and you'll just be looking at him? No. See, see what happens with titles. Even when some people, some of these sports people are getting old and they are supposed to retire honorably, they say they want to compete again. Aha. Uh -huh. Against the false ideas making the rounds about Jesus' identity and mission, we are presented once again with the ideal of what? A suffering servant whose life is characterized by humility and service and exemplified in the cross. Jesus teaches that his followers should be ambitious for true greatness, which is not to be found in being masters of, masters of others, but in being servants of others. And service, listen, just as Tony said, or uh, um, service rendered to the least is the best of all services. As you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Service offered to the least is the best of all services. The really great people and the happiest of people, and this, this one has been confirmed by scientific study. A lot of scientific study has confirmed this. The really great people and the happiest of people are not those who seek to further their own interests, but those who devote their lives to serve the interests of others. This is an area that has been well studied from University of Pennsylvania to Harvard University. It's called the science of happiness. And people have learned what is it that makes people happy and fulfilled for all their life. Not um, a momentary acceleration, not momentary whatever, but happy all their life. It is in the service of people and the the, the more difficult the task that you commit yourself to in serving the poor and the weak and the handicapped, the happier you become. When you served Prof before he died, after he died, after all your service, were you not happy? Were you not happy? Good. The more difficult, you see, your happiness is created by the more difficult the service is the happier you become. That's the irony of our life. But it is so difficult for us to accept it. Only people who have gone through it know it, isn't it? Only people who have gone through it know it. Jesus confronts the worldly logic of wealth and power and, and prestige and control to which many have enslaved themselves with the heavenly wisdom of what? The greatest that comes through humble service. He makes it clear that his own kingdom is not about seeking honor and glory for oneself, but about serving others and seeking the dignity and their dignity and comfort. Only those who are prepared to serve others, to wash others' feet, to die for others, will get to the top position in Jesus' kingdom. We tend to define people in terms of the positions of power they occupy, the amount of money they control, in our own society, the amount of money they control, even if we know that they stole it. Aha, that is where we too, we are idiots. That is where we too go, cannot go without blame. The amount of money they control, the political and social influence they exercise, the millions of followers they have on social media, even if it is nonsense they are posting. It is nonsense they are posting, but they have millions of followers, so they are great. The people who make them great, are idiots. Because people are posting nonsense. They are posting themselves naked. They are posting themselves doing all kinds of nonsense. And then you are checking their, you are, you are, you are giving them thumbs up. You are subscribing. You are doing it. Then they are making money. Continuing to do all those stupid things. And how come that a lot of young people don't know that we are the one creating these monsters? Because if you were not patronizing them, will they be great? No. 
Even as Christians, we often forget that those who are dearest to Jesus are not the celebrities, but those he calls the least of his brethren. Rank and position have little to do with Christ's idea of greatness or importance. I mean, we have to ask yourself, what will Jesus do? How will Jesus take this? Not rank and position. In his eyes, the simple task of a sweeper in Luke's Terra Chapel is just as important as the work of the chaplain, the parish priest, the archbishop, or even the pope. Jesus teaches that in God's eyes and in Christian service, there are no menial jobs. Again, can we say, in Christian service, there are no menial jobs. Yes. Greatness is not found in possessions, power, position, or prestige. It is discovered in goodness, humility, service, and character. Luther King says what? Life's most persistent and urgent attention is, what are you doing for others? What are you doing? No, I mean, that's why I keep having a problem when many Nigerians, something became became part of our vocabulary in recent times, say he has done well for himself. It's stupid, actually. To do well is to do well for others. If you have just done well for yourself, you are not doing well. You have done badly, if it is just for yourself. But you have been hearing it, isn't it? He has done well for himself. How did we accept that as part of our expressions, social expressions? He has done well for himself. It's actually not a compliment. You get the point I'm making? It's not, a comp it's not a good thing to say that he has done well for himself. If I hear that Father George has done well for himself, I will go and weep. Oh yes, I will go and weep. Father George has done well for himself. Abba. No. None of us should be described in that way. We should describe you. Aspire to be described that he has done well for his people. He has done well for the country. Not everyone can be famous, yes, but everyone can be great because greatness is determined by and everyone can serve. It is the irresponsibility or service that most people find the meaning that sustains them through life. It is not in happiness. It is not in impulsive happiness, meaning momentary happiness. The measure of a man's greatness is not in the number of servants he has, but in the number of people he serves. No time is better spent than in the service of others. Now, the greatness, true greatness, true leadership is achieved not by reducing men to one service, but in giving oneself in selfless service to others. Yes, really great persons, therefore, are those who serve the poor, the sick, the weak, the orphan, the handicapped, the aged, the prisoner, the abandoned, the most vulnerable in society. Emerson says, to know, just to know that even one life has pretended easier because you lived. This is to have succeeded. Just to know that somebody has pretended easier. You have made life easier for one person. There should be no confusion at all. The road to greatness and success for every Christian, therefore, is loving service. Scripture passages for our reflection. Read once again Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46. As you did it for the list of my brethren, you did it to me. Unless you become like little children, uh, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Matthew 18, 1 to 4. His state was divine, but he did not cling equality with God. Philippians 2, 6 to 11. And 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 10. The love of money is the root of all evils. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. Glorify your holy name. Thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you once again. Your son Jesus Christ made a second prediction of his passion and death and resurrection. But as usual, the disciples did not understand. Even we today still find it difficult to understand. Lord, open our eyes. Open our hearts. Open our ears. Help us to hear your word and know the deeper meaning of your word. Lord, help preachers to know the deeper meaning of your words and to preach the authentic truth to our hungry people, our people who are desiring to come close to you. Help the leaders 
help the teachers in our churches not to lead people astray, but to lead them squarely to your kingdom through Christ our Lord. I believe in one God. Sisters and brothers, true greatness according to the mind of Christ consists in being a servant of all. Let us pray for the grace to be ever willing to serve others, especially the needy ones. For the leaders of the church, that following the injunction of Christ, they may always be available to serve those placed under their care especially the poor and lowly. We pray, O Lord, Lord hear our for those in public office, that God may grant them his protection and fill them with the wisdom they need to promote the good of those they govern. We pray, O Lord, Lord For the sick, the poor, the imprisoned, the grieving, and the homeless. That we may care for them as if they were Jesus himself, even into our hands. We pray, O Lord, Lord hear our for our local community, that Christ our Redeemer may teach us how to pray well and truly be the salt and light of the world. We pray, O oh Lord, for the dead, especially those of our parish communities and family members, that they may find eternal rest with the Lord. We pray, O Lord, Lord hear our for the success of the evangelization and leadership development programs of the Luke Terra Leadership Foundation and for the intentions of its partners and benefactors. We pray, O Lord. Lord hear Let us now pray in silence for our private intentions. We pray, O oh Lord. Let us ask for the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.
Almighty God and Father, you are kind and full of compassion. Help us to serve one another as you will, and in your goodness, hear the prayers we make to you in childlike trust. Grant this through Christ our Lord. and brothers that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Amen. Receive with favor, O Lord, we pray, the offerings of your people, that what they profess with devotion and faith may be theirs through these heavenly mysteries, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death. And by rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, your fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of our faith. Lord, 
Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, O Lord, your share spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of her charity together with Francis our Pope, Ignatius our Bishop, and other clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and only have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Amen. on us all, we pray. Thy blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the blessed Joseph as spouse, blessed apostles, and all the saints are pleased you throughout the ages. May Mary to be co-ace and eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through her Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Amen. What in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let's so fight for the sign of peace. Come of God, take your way in the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Come of God, take your way in the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Come of God, take your way in the sins of the world. And us. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him takes away the sin of the world. Bless our people who are called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Graciously raise up, O Lord, those you renew with this sacrament, so that we may come to possess your redemption both in mystery and in the manner of our life. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This Mass ascended, let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be.